All right, so let's take a look at surface integrals over vector fields. So now, uh, instead of looking at this piece in three dimensions, right, and trying to figure out the mass of this thing, we're going to go ahead and apply a vector field and see exactly what that is. And you can think about the analog of, of curve integrals or line integrals uh, when it came to um, um, vector fields, we were looking at them out of work. So here is a little bit different. So if we, let's say we have a vector field and we have a surface S in the field. So if F describes the velocity of flow or fluid at any point across the surface, then the rate of flow amount per volume of the flow is called a flux. So all we're really thinking about now is that now we have a surface itself. So we got some sort of surface and we got the, um, so here's our surface and now we have some sort of field. So what we're really looking at is we're looking at a little patch. We're seeing how much of it, of this flow or this fluid is coming out or in into the, uh, into this particular surface. So when we can kind of quantify this particular flow with this word flux. So the rate of flow is called flux. Okay. And our flux integral is basically kind of the same analog as uh, our uh, line integral over vector fields. It's just a double, the surface integral of f dot ds. Okay. So here s is regarded as a vector and that is given by the parametric equations of the surface. So whatever the parametric equations of the surface is, that's what, what we're going to be dotting it with. Now we have to be very careful with, with flux because we're looking at normal vectors. Um, so when we look at, look at Green's theorem, in Green's theorem, we can kind of think about it as the amount of circulation around this particular region. And the way that we looked at circulation, we were looking at the tangent vectors. How much am I changing at, at uh, are my tangent vectors changing at every point? But when we think about flux, we're not looking about around the curve. We're kind of looking at either at inside or outside. And if you think about inside or outside, we're really looking at our normal vectors. How much is coming out of it or how much is coming into it? So that's why we have to kind of redirect the way that we're going to be looking at, at um, this particular integral. So one of the things that we have to be very aware of is what does counterclockwise and clockwise mean in, in a surface? Because we really can't think of clockwise or counterclockwise of a surface because what does that even mean here? Uh, especially if you have like a circle or, or a sense of a, some sort of sphere. So the way that we're going to do it is that positive orientation is going to be going outward negative orientation is going to be going inward. So that's how we're going to go ahead and describe it. Okay, so here is a little bit of a proof on how we're going to uh, find the flux, okay? So kind of like how I, I said it, so you can kind of read here a little bit of what's happening. Um, hopefully this kind of made a little, little more sense of why we're going to be using normal vectors because we're looking at insides and outsides. We're not really looking at tangent vectors anymore. We're kind of looking at how much stuff is coming inside, how much stuff is coming outside. So we would kind of need to use a normal vector instead. So kind of think about it a little bit more geometrically. Um, let's say ds is an element of the oriented surface. So it's very similar to the line integral. Uh, and then the line integral, we were using the tangent vector. Since you want the flow that is going outward, it would make sense for the surface integral to go uh, to be equal to the normal vector. Okay. So if you look at this picture right here on the left, so you see the normal vector. So the normal vector is over here. So this is our normal vector to the surface, okay? And this is our force vector, so how much is coming out of it? So this yellow one right here is how much is coming out. All right. So in order for me to know this, okay, it will kind of make sense to kind of break up this force vector into two components. So you can break it up as this vertical component of the force vector, and the vertical component of the of the force vector. And all you really got to do in order to be able to find this amount is just basically taking the dot product of these guys, right? Just take the force vector and the normal vector, take the for, the dot product, and that will give you the maximum extent, okay, of, of the amount that's coming out of the field. So taking the force vector, dotting it with the, with the normal vector over this entire surface, D, ds, will give us the amount of flux. So let's say a vector can be, a normal vector can be found. You can find it by the parametric equations z equals g of x comma y. So this is the parametric, uh, parametrization in a most simple form. So here's a simple form. 
So if I take the partial derivative with respect to x, you're going to get a vector i, and, the, uh, and then the j component goes away because there's no, no y, and then the partial derivative of this with respect to x. And then you take the partial derivative with y, right? So then this guy is going to go away. You're left with the 1, and then you're left with this one with y. So to, to find an orthogonal vector, all we really got to do is just take the cross product. Because remember, if I take the cross product of two different vectors, I end up getting an orthogonal vector. So that's what I'm going to do. Take the cross product. And what you end up getting is this weird function. Okay. So this guy is our normal vector. Normal vector. Okay. Now you have to be very careful because this normal vector can either point inside or outside, depending on the direction in which you take the cross product. One way to do it is just plug in a number to make sure that it's pointing either in the inside or in the outside. So this is going to be our vector. We want the normal vector. So we're going to take the unit vector. Okay, by taking, dividing it by its magnitude, which is another horrific thing. <coughs> and now we're going to plug it into our integral. So if I know that my vector field is pqr, then you know that the flux is going to be f dot dn. Our f is pqr. And then I'm going to take our n vector, which is what we just found out. ds is just a surface area, which is this guy, which we've been doing already. You can see that the denominators are going to go ahead and cancel out. So these guys cancel out. And all I'm left with is just the vector dotted with the normal vector and with respect to dA. So when you do that, you get negative P partial of G, negative Q partial of, of G with Y, and then plus R dA. So this tells us that the oriented, if the surface is oriented in the positive orientation with basic parametrization z equals g of x comma y, our flux is going to be given to you by this formula. And here g is the parametrization of, uh, of, our, of, our, um, of our surface. If it's, so this is if z is g of x comma y. If I went ahead and did it in the other direction, if y equals oriented in, G, in the xz plane, the flux, some of them are kind of alternated now. So now instead of the q doesn't get anything, and the g and x and the, and the gz go into the p and the r. Same thing goes with a, a different orientation in, the, in terms of the uh, y and z plane. So this guy right here, the flux itself is going to be this. So now you can see that the y and the z are mainly getting the partials. Okay. Now, if it's unique, so let's say instead you couldn't express it in that form. Well, that means we're not going to find, we're just going to stay here with the cross product. Okay. We're going to just stay there with the cross product. So we are going to redo this the following way. So if you have a unique parametrization, the flux, so if you have cylinders, for example, the flux is going to be equal to still F, but dotted with the cross product of RU and cross RV. So this one, you actually have to do a little bit more work. All right. So now this involves a lot of work. Okay. For the second one, again, if it's pointing outward is for positive orientation. If you want to check, you can easily do this by plugging in a point. Okay. So let's go ahead and start with the problem. This problem is going to be the long way. Later on, I'm going to show you a shortcut when we get to the divergence theorem. Okay, so, but let's go ahead and do an example. Okay. So here we have, we want to find the flux over the surface integral, where F is equal to this force field. So F is this force field, and the surface consists of three different surfaces. So the top is a paraboloid, okay, from 1 to 4. The size is a cylinder from one, zero to one, and the bottom is just z equals zero. So let's go ahead and graph this. So the top is a paraboloid. It goes all the way up to four. It's going downward. And this is gonna be from one to four. So you got a paraboloid. And it's sad because it's negative. Then from the sides, you get zero to one. So from zero all the way to one, you get a, a cylinder of radius one. Okay. 
and then the bottom you get z equals zero, okay, which is basically just the base itself. Okay, so you want to find the total amount of flux in the outward direction, right, based on this force field. So you want to know how much is coming out of it. So there's a force field somewhere in here, right, and sometimes it might be going up or down or whatever. You want to know how much flux is coming out, okay. Remember, flux is the amount of flow, okay? So let's go ahead and, and figure that out. So let's just start off with a top, okay? So the top might be a little nice. So let's start off with the top. So let's start off by parametrizing it first. Uh, we can do a basic parametrization. Um, so we can do x equals uh, 4. Uh, oh, no, that's wrong. x equals x. Let's just let y equals y and z equals 4 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared. All right, I think this is a little easier to work with. You can use the other ones, but I want to be, I don't want to, I want to avoid the cross product as much as I can. So this one's going to be super easy. Uh, now that we got this, remember this is our g of x comma y. All right, so now let's go ahead and set up our integral, our flux integral. So the flux for the top. So because it's a basic parametrization, we can just use this guy, this yellow one. Okay, so we're going to use that formula to find the flux. So to find the flux, it's going to be the double integral over the region D of negative P G sub X minus Q G sub Y plus R D A. Okay, so this is going to be the double integral over the region D. So now remember P, Q, and R are basically this, P, Q, and R. And now because we want it in the outward, outward direction, this uh, this formula was derived under the consideration that it was going outward. So we're gonna, um, this formula basically, we don't need to check any of the normal vectors, everything is done. So P in this case is gonna be this X, Y, negative X, Y, our partial derivative with respect to x is going to be negative 6x. Q in this case, what was Q? Negative 1 half y squared. Then partial is negative 6y plus z. So z is all of this guy. So, the, so 4 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared dA. Okay, so let's go ahead and... and Make this a little nicer. So double in a girl. So negative six, no positive six x squared y, uh, positive negative three y cubed. Uh, I'm gonna write plus four minus three x squared minus three y squared. Yay. Okay. So now let's go ahead and set our um, um, our limits of integration. So if you can take a look at this, so what exactly would be the region D? So the region D is going to be whatever this guy is right here, whatever that circle is right there. Okay, so we need to see, well, if you look at Z itself, okay, if we look at this uh, top part, it's going from Z equals 1 to Z equals 4. So if you look at... Um, the circle itself. You can let's take a look at. Um, what can I write it? Let me write it up here. So at z equals one. What exactly is happening? So we got one is equal to uh, four minus three x squared minus three y squared. And negative three equals negative three x squared minus three y squared. So you get um, x squared plus y squared equals one. Okay. And then as z equals 4, okay, so what's happening up there? So as z equals 4, let me write it up here. You get 4 equals 4 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared. You got 0 equals negative 3x squared minus 3y squared. Okay, so that's just a circle of radius 0. So it, it takes a, it seems that it's going to be a circle from, a, a circle of radius 0 to a circle of radius 1. So I can convert this to polar. Okay, so this is going to be, oh gosh, this is going to be terrible. 
um, so um, this guy you're gonna have the integral okay so this is gonna be from R so you're gonna get 0 to 1 and this is gonna be 0 to 2 pi this guy's gonna be 6 R cosine theta and this is going to be squared and then y r sine theta okay and then you're going to get minus 3 r sine theta cubed plus 4 the other one's going to be minus 3 r squared and it's going to be times r dr d theta Okay. okay, so that's what we end up getting. Okay, so um, I will leave this as an exercise for you. I actually have the answer here. So it's going to be 5 pi over 2. We've done already these integrals many, many different times. So this is the total amount of, 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 um, of flux. Okay, so the amount of flux coming out from the, from the paraboloid. All right. Okay, so now let's go ahead and... and look at the other one. So if you want to also think about flux as the mass per unit, time per unit area coming from here. Now let's look at the sides. Okay, so the sides we're going to have to involve some of the cross product. So how much flux is coming in and out from this other area. So, so flux, the so sides. And the sides is just the x squared plus y squared equals 1. And then z is between 0 and 1. Our parametric equations, because this is a circle of radius 1, is going to be uh, 1 cosine theta, sine theta, and then z is just going to be equal to z. So to find the flux, we're going to have to find the double integral over the region d of f dot it with the cross product. Okay, so in this case, we're going to have the double integral of d of f dotted with r theta cross rz. Okay, so what would be the cross product? So I'm going to have r theta cross rz Okay, so r theta is going to be negative sine, cosine, and then 0, and then 0, 0, 1. So it seems like the first one's just going to give me cosine theta i hat plus sine theta j hat. All right, now here's you have to be very careful because remember this is in the outward direction. You have to make sure that it's in the outward direction. But you can see that these guys are actually going to go in the outward direction. These both are positive. So these guys are coming outside. If I plug in pi over 2, right, you can see that it's coming out upward. right? So these guys are actually coming outward. If they were negative, you would have the inward. So if, and if, if at any time you make a mistake and you actually end up getting an inward vector, then you could just multiply it by negative 1. Okay, so now all we're going to do is just go ahead and... and 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 take the dot product of this guy so um double integral over the region d so cosine theta sine theta well let me write it this way so we know that the vector field had x and y up here so i'm going to go ahead and put that I'm going to plug in all that stuff in there based on on this. So we know what x and y is. So the first one's going to be x cosine theta sine theta. And we got a negative one half y squared, so that's sine squared theta. And then we got a z, which is just going to be the z component. And I'm going to take the dot product with what I just found out, which is going to be the cosine theta sine theta. And then the zero is going to be da. So 
So this guy is going to give me the double integral over the region D of cosine squared theta sine theta plus one half sine cubed theta dA. Now we know this is a circle of radius one. So converting to polar will be from zero to one and zero to two pi. Okay, so here um, we're gonna have r cosine squared theta sine theta plus one half r sine cubed theta dr d theta, okay? And what you're gonna end up getting here, you're actually gonna end up getting zero. So there actually is no flux here. Um, or you can kind of think about it that the amount of flux that's coming in is the same thing as it's coming out. So that's basically what this means. So now the last one, the bottoms, z equals zero. So the bottom, so z equals zero, we can just let x equal x and y equal y. Okay, so we're gonna, this one seems like a very basic one, right? So it looks like we can use the same formula, the double integral over the region D, okay? Now in this case, uh, we're gonna have negative P G sub X minus Q G sub Y plus R D A. Here is our G. But notice that when I take the derivatives, these two are going to just go, they're just going to go away. So you're going to have the double integral over D, 0 plus 0. R in this case is Z also, which is also another 0. There's actually 0 here. So nothing there. So the total amount of flux, total flux, is just a 5 pi over 2. Okay. Now, we are going to do a, a shortcut version because you can tell this one's a lot of work. It's a lot, a heck of a lot of work. So when we learn the divergence theorem, you'll, we're going to redo this problem and you'll see how easy it is.